Hello, I'm Marty, and we are here at the Open Stack Summit in Vancouver, Canada. And today we have with us Elizabeth. I think we have known each other for a very long time, right? Very long time. We have done yeah. so many things in the open source world. So tell us yeah. about your, uh, your your journey. Yeah. So um, it, it's funny going around these open source communities because people tend to know me from different things. Um, so first, I mean, I think. Where, where I started making a lot of contributions was over in the Ubuntu community. Yes. And so I still work with, I, you know, I still keep in touch with those people and I mm. still work on They're nice Ubuntu. People. They're nice people. Yeah, yeah. I have some, you know, good, like, long term friendships that came out of that. Um, so I, I still do a little bit for Ubuntu. Um, at scale this year, I spoke at UbuCon again because they invite me back every year. And I'm like, what am I going to talk about? Right. So <laughs> I always come up with something. Um, and then, um, of course, you know, I think it was five and a half years ago now, I was hired by HP to work on OpenStack. Um, and so the Ubuntu work I did was all volunteer work. Um, and I was just working as a systems administrator elsewhere. Um, so when I was hired at HP, that was the first time I was really paid full time to work mm -hmm. on open source software. So that was a really exciting time for me. And now we're here at an OpenStack Summit. Um, and uh, I've been going to these for quite some time. Um, right. But I missed a few, because a year and a half ago, I started working at Mesosphere on containers. Right. So I sort of feel like I've been going up the stack throughout my career, like starting with Linux and then OpenStack and now Mesos, which can run on top of OpenStack. So it's been an interesting time and meeting a lot of the same people, honestly, throughout the, the journey. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. That's the yeah, same yeah. people. So, so what is the next on the stack? Machine learning, artificial intelligence? So I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I mean, there, there's kind of, there's kind of, I could go two ways, right? Like, mm -hmm. since I'm into infrastructure, I could go like the serverless route and start supporting like serverless platforms, mm -hmm. or as you say, like workloads. Like, I could start getting into machine learning and do like some of the Spark and TensorFlow and like doing a lot of the data manipulation. Um, but I think serverless is kind of the way to go, mm -hmm. um, at least in, in my perspective, for, for my background and what I do. Why so. do you think so? Um, partially because I'm not. I'm not really into all that data. Like, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess personally and just like expertise wise, mm -hmm. like I'm really like deep down an old Linux systems administrator. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the workloads on top of that, um, it's just not, I guess, what I've been experienced with. Okay. So, um, and, but at the, you know, the serverless stuff, it actually goes right in hand, like being able to just present an infrastructure for developers to use right out of the box. It's kind of a progression of what I've been doing my entire career. Right. Um, just every step has made it slightly easier <laughs> for developers to deploy on a platform I'm working on. Yeah. Uh, since we talked about your evolution and since you're, you have evolved, you know, kind of the way the open source and the next level. So uh, from your perspective, uh, uh, how, how, how do you see the evolution of the whole, you know, uh, adoption of open source. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that because I my, the first systems administration job I had, um, I, I remember we did this, um, uh, I guess it was like a workshop for customers. And, and the talks were so funny because, you know, this was like 2004, 2005, and they were like, what is open source? Mm -hmm. How do I choose between the options? And it seems like these things have been adopted so thoroughly into, into today's industry that people don't ask those questions anymore. Um, but at the same time, you get into companies, and there's a lot who think they're open source companies. They have an open source product, but they do a lot of the work behind the scenes. Um, they're hiring a lot of developers who really just aren't familiar with open source technology. So I think there's still a lot of education to be had there. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I'm doing, uh, so I'm now a developer advocate over at Mesosphere, and one of the things I'm working on is developing an internal um, training just for people, everyone in the company, really, mm -hmm. about open source. Um, because, you know, when the company is small and it's a startup and, you know, these people are passionate about Mesos and passionate about technologies. Right. But as the company grows, you end up bringing in a lot of people who aren't necessarily open source developers, exactly. don't really know a lot about it. Um, so that continuing education um, for the developers who are new to it or, you know, are familiar with it enough to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's something I'm, I actually care a lot about and I want to make sure that everyone's getting the right message and that we're being clear right. with what open source is and what we're striving for. Within your own capacity, uh, what do you do to help either your colleagues or...? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I mean, is actually just attending events like this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's giving a lot of talks about open infrastructure mm -hmm. um, because, again, you know, working on Linux and OpenStack and containers and such, like, throughout my career, it's been something that's really important to me. So I don't want... It, the same arguments that can be made for using not using proprietary software can be made for not being locked exactly. into a proprietary cloud. Mm -hmm. And I feel really strongly about that. So right. I think one of the things I, I care about is with things like Kubernetes mm -hmm. and Mesos and everything is that you use those to some degree on your cloud on the cloud platforms, but don't tie yourself into 
the proprietary nature of those clouds. So don't hook into the, all their fancy little um, applications and storage options and all that stuff inside the cloud, but make your applications portable and your infrastructure portable. So you can run it on Amazon or you can run it on Azure or move it, or move it on prem if you want to. There are you know, ways that people do get logged in yeah. and sometimes people don't care because they, oh yeah, that eases my <laughs> yeah. management, you know. So, yeah, and so, so can you just kind of you know, elaborate on this a bit? Yeah, I mean, th there is definitely something to be said for developer time. Um, it does take longer if you want to implement your, your own solutions. Um, but there are open source solutions for a lot of these things. Like if you want to use an S3 bucket, you could do something like Minio instead. Um, and there are open source technologies out there. So I, you know, I say use as many of those as you can. And if it really does come down to the wire, like lock yourself in in a few specific ways, but be very aware that that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So that when you want to migrate off the platform, which I admit is not easy unto mm -hmm. itself, like it is very comp you can't just move it to another cloud, right? Right. Um, but when you do that, you actually know what all of your stuck points are. Mm -hmm. So you can make a migration plan appropriately ahead of time without trying to migrate and realizing you have locked yourself into all these things that you didn't realize you did. Uh, how to avoid this situation altogether? What, do you have any kind of checklist for them? I don't. <laughs> I should. Um, I, do, I do give a talk um, that's about mostly about the things you should, should consider before locking yourself exactly. into mm -hmm. um, these uh, platforms, um, which aren't only, only cloud platforms. Because yes. um, I, I do a lot of work in CI, CD, which is actually one of the reasons I'm here for the mm -hmm. Open Dev Conf. Um, and the, uh, one of the things there, there's a lot of proprietary CI stuff out there yeah. um, to do all of your software testing. And I say, you know, if you're going to use one of these because it's easy and it looks really nice, that's okay, but mm -hmm. you have to remember, like, consider long-term costs and how you're going to extract yourself from this if you need to in the future. Um, and yeah, the same thing just goes for proprietary clouds. When you look at serverless uh, or function as a service, you mm -hmm. know, uh, if you're using public cloud, you are kind of getting logged in there too. Yeah, so a lot of the existing serverless platforms out there are very much locked in. Ex yeah. It's, it, and I think that's why, I mean, that is why I care about it on the mm -hmm. open source side, is because I'd rather see people launching the open source serverless solutions mm -hmm. um, than building you know, your whole platform into Lambda or whatever else is going to be out there on the market. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean that is like the epitome of vendor lock-in <laughs> is like building your entire application against right, someone else's right, right. infrastructure. It defies in that the whole way. purpose. Yeah. Yeah. CNCF came out with cloud events. So do you think there are any efforts going on to mitigate that kind of vendor lock-in? I'm I'm hopeful. Okay. Um, but at the same time, even at open source conferences, I've been seeing a lot of like Lambda talks. I know. I know. And 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 all that, and I'm, so I'm like, oh, you know, I think awareness needs to be raised about that. I think more. Yeah, this is something. Yeah, I I think I, because I've been covering open source for a very long time, and yeah. the whole point was no vendor lock-in. Yeah. And here we talk, no offenses to AWS or whatever, but people mm -hmm. you know talk about, and I see this defies the whole point. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's there's I mean I, there's a lot of reasons we went to open source. It's you know vendor yeah. lock-in. It was security. It was being owner owner being an owner of your data. Oh, no, data. And. And a big one there is knowing what the vendor is going to do with your data. I mean, you made promises to your customers, and right. then you're just offloading it to some cloud. Um, and you know, the big the big vendors are legitimate when it comes to this. I mean, Amazon has very clear yes, rules around course, this, yes. and Azure and mm -hmm. Google and everyone. Um, but there are a lot of smaller vendors out there, and there's a lot of laws, even governing data, that you have to be really careful of. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, when I, we, I was in a session last yesterday, and we talked about developers going rogue. Where they just grab a credit card and you know go create a cloud account and create their own like shadow ops, um, which is outside of the company because they they're trying to get something done exactly. and they just want to do it. Um, but you can really run afoul there when you are trying to deploy an application and the vendor doesn't have very friendly data rules. Right, right. So right. it's a lot to think about there. So not just vendor lock-in. There's you know yeah security and there's an outage. What do you do? I mean, exactly. mm -hmm. they'll the vendor will give you a credit. But what does a credit do when exactly. your company was down for a day? Right, right, exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, any other concerns that you have, you know, as, as somebody who is, I mean, we actually need more people like you in the open source community <laughs> who are actually genuine concern. I understand uh, commercial entities, not commercial entities, but, you know, vendors, you know, they want to play nice with each other and mm -hmm. that makes sense because that's what customers want. They want to move yeah. their workload. But uh, awareness, you know, that. what are the other problems that you're seeing in the, as you are evolving, you know, in your journey? Yeah, I mean, I guess the big one is that it's just there's ease of use over the open source philosophies mm -hmm. has been a big one. And I, I mentioned CI/CD earlier, and that, that's been a big one. I mean, I've seen a lot of open source projects 
not only going to GitHub, which mm -hmm. is an issue unto itself, <laughs> um, but using using the proprietary platform, so the CI CD tooling. And they do this, I understand, because they're small projects, yes. they don't have the resources, um, no one's volunteering to do it, and so it's either using the proprietary platforms or not doing it. Right. Um, and software testing is important, and a lot of projects recognize this. So I'm concerned that we're at this point where it's either you don't do testing at all or you use the proprietary platform. Right. And so one of the things I'm excited about is seeing some of these initiative to like productize CI, CD. Like there's the new Jenkins X project, mm -hmm. which makes it really easy to run Jenkins on a Kubernetes cluster. It's like all self-contained. It automatically runs your tests on little Kubernetes containers. Mm -hmm. um, but there needs to be more of that. Right. Um, because I am concerned that too many open source projects are taking the easy way out because they want to get work done. And they think that's the only way they can do it. And I think open source just meaning like these open source projects need to do a better job at making it easy. Yes. Like I mean, Jenkins X is trying to do that in some way. Um, but if I mean, I'll use Jenkins itself as an example. It's really hard to configure, right. and I it's was really hard to Burns, run. You know, of, uh, yeah. that, and they were like, yeah. so we're like, you know, it was not meant to make it easier for you. Know, <laughs> that yeah. was not the goal. So many it. options and so many. Yes, you know, yes. I, I understand why the software got complex, but right. it's just. I mean, when I started using Jenkins, you know, five years ago, like it was still complex even at mm -hmm, that time. And mm -hmm. now I look at it, I'm like, you know, it's yeah. it's yeah. The more open source tries to emulate what the proprietary offerings are doing, I think the better off we'll be. One of the reasons I'm really excited about GitLab because GitLab, it's beautiful and it works well. Mm -hmm. um, it even has a Docker registry built into mm -hmm. it now, even in the open source version. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm really excited about what they're doing because it really is it. it does a lot of the things that GitHub does, and it's open source. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned Docker, and Docker, you know, they try to make things easier. I mean, I think that's why they did so well. I mean, it became such a household name in technology spaces. Yeah, they're Apple yeah. of the. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you do in your free time? Um, I don't have a lot of free time left. Um, <laughs> you blog. I have, you I have, have your I have, blog and your I Flickr. Do. Yep. So I, I have a cat. <laughs> okay. That's not a work. You work for a cat, so that's not a <laughs> hobby. I have two, so. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, honestly, like I. It, it's funny because a lot of my hobbies are also technology based. So I, I'm still on the board of a nonprofit in San Francisco that does. Uh, Ubuntu, we put Lubuntu machines mm -hmm. in um, low income housing facilities. San Francisco? Yep. Yeah. So it's uh, called Partimus. Uh, so we used to work in schools. Right. So we, we would go to a school, usually a lot of the public okay. charter schools, and deploy labs there. Okay. Um, but the schools mostly switched switch to Chromebooks. Okay. Oh, yes. Which is, I mean, it's Linux. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to call that a win. Yeah. Um, and we realized during. The last couple of years, we were in the schools that we were all we were doing is optimizing Firefox to run Java and Flash for the teachers. Mm. So their their switch to Chromebooks actually makes a okay. lot of sense. Yes. Um, so we've sort of changed um, what we're doing with the nonprofit. No, you're, you're moving to the technology again. I, I was know, talking right? about. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get away. You don't watch Black Mirror. <laughs> I don't watch a lot of TV. <laughs> no, that's science fiction about all the technology and IoT. You know, I can watch like one episode at a time, and then I'm just sad for a few days. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I travel to all these events, when like six or seven or eight hours flight, yeah. like I'm tomorrow I'm flying to Prague for Open Suze conference, yeah. so I'll binge watch again a whole series and be done with that. Are you still involved with the with the desktop Linux community at all, or are you totally a little bit? So I'm still involved with the Zubuntu community, you, yes. yeah. And so I I do I'm I think I'm technically their marketing lead. Oh really? Which means I do Twitter. You get paid? No, <laughs> we, none of us get paid. <laughs> um, but I, I, I like staying. I like staying involved in in that space a tiny bit, like in my free time, partially because of the work with Partimus, um, because we are de still deploying desktops into those low income facilities, mm -hmm. um, and partially because I I still use Ubuntu mm -hmm. like on all my laptops and desktops. So so before we wrap, any closing thoughts you have? Any message to the world? <laughs> Be careful of proprietary clouds. <laughs> <laughs> it's still the, the typical open source message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, thanks for talking yeah. to me today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>